At the University of Toledo, we are surrounded by experts. And we tap into those experts here on Rocket Talk. Elon Musk bought Twitter for $44 billion. It was a wild ride before the deal was even closed, with Elon threatening to pull out because he was lied to and Twitter threatening to sue. The ride has gotten even wilder since the deal closed. Massive layoffs, controversial figures, accounts being reinstated and then resuspended, the release of the Twitter files, it's all been very confusing. Here to help us unpack what's happening and the implications are two professors from the University of Toledo who do work on technology and culture. I'd like to welcome our returning guest, Dr. Amin Allred, and newcomer to the program, Dr. Yonatan Miller. Thank you both for being here. Thanks for having, Thanks us. For having us. So it seems to me that uh, some of the discourse surrounding mm-hmm. Elon's purchase of Twitter has really been around kind of the topic of free speech. Seems as if people are split. I see plenty of people on Twitter celebrating this saying, um, free speech is back, yay. Other people saying really it's uh, kind of the end of free speech for a variety of reasons. I'm just curious, how should we take that, uh, that question and use it to kind of frame our conversation today? Well, I I think we have to bear in mind that uh, the constitutional right to freedom of speech in the First Amendment is not the same thing as free speech absolutism, uh, which is the idea that Elon Musk has floated for Twitter. Uh, For a free speech absolutist like Musk, uh, someone can say whatever they want, uh, whenever they want, wherever they want, uh, without regard to any uh, consequences. Mm -hmm. Um, So consequently, that has opened up the floodgates for hate speech, because if people are not restrained uh, b- by any regulations, if people are allowed to say whatever they want, um, they now have an audience uh, before whom to do so. Um, the problem is that free speech absolutism doesn't really live up to its ideals, because one person's free speech absolutism can chill other people's free speech. Uh, if, if we take a hypothetical group maybe called the Globs, If people speak out about the globs and harass them or say hateful things about them, the globs are going to be reluctant to express themselves. Their free speech will have been compromised. Uh, So there's a lot of tension between the idea of free speech on the one hand, which I think doesn't accurately capture uh, what Musk is all about, and free speech absolutism, which is the ideology that he's promoting. Yeah, and I'm not, I mean, it's interesting. I'm not even sure he actually ends up being successfully, and nor do I think that free speech absolutism is a good idea, but I'm not even sure he actually ends up being successfully a free speech absolutist either, which is something we can talk about in a second. But a couple of things to bear in mind. So one, you know, for better or worse, in the United States, a lot of hate speech does meet constitutional muster. But as Yoni's pointing out, constitutional muster is not necessarily the relevant question for a private business. It's also really important to remember that Twitter is an international company, mm-hmm. and speech rules are are different across the globe. Mm-hmm. This, I mean, this you know, in some ways that are arguably you know, I don't know better or worse, but ways that this ends up being really complicated. So, for example, what does free speech look like in uh, Western Europe? A lot of where hate speech is more heavily regulated. What does it look like to say that you're free speech ab- absolutist when you're doing business with a country like China or Saudi Arabia? Uh, which both of which are both you know have Twitter, but also Elon are, are helping to fund uh, Musk probably, right? So the question of free speech and and globally also gets very complicated for Musk. It's also I think worth noticing that at least so far he hasn't actually behaved like a free speech absolutist. He's let back a lot of accounts that have been suspended for violation violating terms of service, yeah. but he's also vi- banned a lot of new accounts. Mm-hmm. People have charged that this is on political grounds. I don't know if that's true or not, um, but I do think one thing that's interesting to talk about is every social media company has had to have some sort of some sort of vetting policy, right? It's impossible for a social media company to operate globally without having some sort of speech policy. Musk has so far kind of been doing it on the fly, and you know that's it's sort of both legally and morally an interesting thing. Um, I don't know if that really is the kind of transparency or democracy he's been talking about. You say legally, I mean it's his company. Can he? I mean. Legally, <laughs> could be, bar whoever he wanted, right? So legally, he can bar whoever he wants. So the speech issue, issue becomes different, right? Mm-hmm. So if he's, if he's, for example, hosting hate speech in Western Europe, he's going to be in a lot of legal trouble. Mm-hmm. And actually, most of his Brussels office has quit or been laid yeah, off. So, so. <laughs> Well, okay, so he promised us a council of some kind. Um, and you know, I thought it was interesting when he was debating whether or not to let Trump back on Twitter, he opened things up to a poll. Um, but then recently he, you know, suspended Kanye West's account, he seemed to do that of his own volition. Um, 
Uh, I'm just curious, like, what is the mechanisms by which he's using to decide who gets to speak and who doesn't on Twitter? It seems to me maybe we're lacking yeah. a coherent vision for how that comes together. That is the $44 billion question. <laughs> right? I mean, I don't think we have an answer, and I don't think he has an answer, um, which is a bizarre thing, right? Um, yeah, I mean, ideally, a lot of people who work on this and a lot of, uh, like, philosophers of, of social media advocate transparent rules that that some sort of council uh, follows, right? And, and I think that, frankly, I think that's the best answer, right? But yeah, that's not what we've actually gotten. What we've gotten is a poll that, you know, was very taken scientific. by whoever. Yeah, very yeah. scientific. <laughs> How many bots voted yeah. one way or the other, right? One of my sock public accounts voted one way, my other sock public account voted the other way. I'm totally kidding, but you know, like... <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, yeah. he, surely he has to have a, a plan, right? I mean, you don't spend $44 billion on something and not know what you're doing, or maybe he did. Uh, I, I, th yeah. I think his, his plan uh, reminds me of the line uh, written by Irving Berlin, uh, anything you can do, I can do it better. <laughs> um, and essentially his plan is being written on, on the fly. He really trusts his own instincts. And, uh, you know, one of Musk's mottos is move fast and break things. That's how he manages Tesla. That's how he manages SpaceX. And part of me thinks that he actually enjoys his products being in a perpetual state of flux, mm -hmm. being pr a little bit uh, unstable, being in beta mode. Uh, his much touted self-driving uh, Teslas is still in beta. Um, so to a certain extent, his plan is to keep things evolving and maybe keeping them in beta is a sign to his fans uh, that he's continually improving, he's continually uh, receptive to, to their ideas, which incidentally he is. Uh, he is, as many people have said, serving almost as a customer service representative for Twitter uh, and is re very much responsive to individual inquiries. Yeah, yeah and I, I do want to talk about that in a minute because I think that's a really interesting point. But you know, talking about kind of things being in perpetual motion or beta testing, you know, the other companies that you mentioned are really kind of tech companies. They seem to be a very different kind of product, you know, than uh, something like Twitter that has, you know, a good portion of the world engaging each other. Um, is this a, is he being overly optimistic about his abilities to do this well? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I mean, and I mean, is he being overly optimistic in his other companies too is a, is a fair question, right? But, but, but focusing specifically on Twitter, yeah. right? Yeah. And not just going into general Elon, Elon Shade as much as I might like to. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing to remember is that it's not clear, we'll never know what was going on in his head, it's not clear that he actually wanted to buy Twitter. Mm. Now, yeah, granted, I can't make a 44, I think that he had a very, he had a, a business plan putting a bet out there. I, I personally don't think he ever thought it was going to be su successful. That said, if you're making that big of a bet, you've got to have some sort of backup plan. Totally recognize I, that, right? I, I yeah. think uh, he has expressed that what he sees in Twitter is the bedrock for what he calls an everything app. Yeah. He wants Twitter to be the American equivalent of WeChat in mm -hmm. China. And WeChat is an app that everyone in China has on their phones. It basically is the engine of communication, of commerce. People schedule uh, telehealth, they order their meals, they pay their bills. And I, I think his vision is we have all these people connected. Let's create an equivalent in the United States. Of course, the United States is not China. Uh, and Elon Musk is not the Chinese government. Um, so it's, it, yeah. it, it's put possible that that was one of his plans from the get-go, but it's purely speculation. Well, and if that is what he wanted, it seems to me as if I'm going to interface with Twitter in all those ways, what I really want is a sense of stability. <laughs> um, and whenever I open my Twitter app now, I mean, all I see is Elon, 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 um, at, to the point where, you know, I was Googling today, like, how do I have less Elon on my, my Twitter <laughs> feed? Because uh, I'm just tired of, of seeing, you yeah. know, responding to everything. You're saying this personalization, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it, it just seems very unbecoming of a CEO, maybe, to be engaging in this way. Um, I don't know. I'm curious about that. And I mean, also, this seems to be going badly. Yeah. Is Elon, is it really going as badly as it seems to those of us on the outside? Is he up to something that we don't know about, right? I mean, it... If this were purely a making money decision, I don't know that he would be. Yeah, it's, I mean, if it's that, if it's that, as of now, it looks like a really bad decision. Now he's got enough money theoretically that he can afford to take a long-term bet. Sure. But yeah, if I was, if the bet looks right now like it's going really badly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's a really good question, and I think you know, back to Yoni's point, like I do think one of the things that he's trying to do, and one of the things that when you're talking about the we we in America often focus on on entrepreneurship. When you're that level of wealth, we're talking about sort of ownership of capital and ownership mm -hmm. of social space. He's competing to try to own that kind of space. 
but I think in ways that have actually, at least in the short run, as, as Yoni's saying, not been successful, right? Yeah. Now, one question is, so, you know, I think I read that the cost of servicing his loan is $1.5 billion a year. Um, that's a lot of money. And the $8 Twitter accounts are not going to go very far. So if he doesn't have a plan to turn it into some sort of other capital, yeah, I think that this looks pretty dangerous for him. And I wanted to add that it's really hard for us to know how Twitter is actually doing. Uh, one of Elon's first moves was to fire uh, the directors of the company, dissolve the board. He is the owner, the, the lo an almost exclusive yeah. shareholder. He has no fiduciary duties to his shareholders or to the board. So anything that he says about the platform is all that we know about the platform. So it's really hard to know where the platform stands right now. Huh, interesting. Well, we are recording this one on a Wednesday. It airs on Friday. I'm worried all of this will be moved by then because <laughs> everything be, seems to be moving so fast. Uh, but I uh, really appreciate you both being here. Thank you so much for being here and helping us make sense of this. Yeah, thank you. And that you. is all the time that we have for Rocket Talk. We'll see you next time.